Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Practice-Based Publishing, Getting Your Public Health Findings Out Into the World, Part 1, Introduction of Publishing. I'm Donnie Zemmel, the Project Coordinator for the Region 5 Public Health Training Center. This webinar is offered in partnership with the Journal for Public Health Management and Practice, Direct, and the American Public Health Association Health Administration section. This webinar is the first in a four-part series and will cover the basics of publishing as a practitioner. Before we begin, a little bit about us. The Region 5 PHTC is part of the National Public Health Learning Network. With nine other training centers across the country, we seek to strengthen the skills of the current and future public health workforce through continuing education and student development. We encourage you to check out our other training offerings on our catalog at RV phtc.org. Now note on some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and all participants are in a listen only mode. Please add your questions or comments into the chat box. We will not be using the raise hand function in this webinar. Depending on the question, we may type an answer back to you or we may save it to the Q&A portion at the end. We will do our best to get to all questions. The slides were sent out in a reminder email this morning. There is no CE offered for this training and the recording and slides will be available in the coming weeks. We'll send out a notification once the on-demand version becomes available. Now I'd like to welcome Justin Moore, the Associate Editor of JPHMP to introduce our speakers and get us started for the day. Thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here. I think we have a great panel of folks that I'm just honored to be a part of. I'm Justin Moore. I am um, the associate editor for the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice and have been uh, for over 13 years now. Um, in my spare time, I'm a faculty member in the Division of Public Health Sciences uh, in the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by uh, J.P. Leiter, who is a senior lecturer in the Division of Health Policy and Management, School of Public Health, University of Minnesota. He's one of our board members and a regular contributor to the journal. Um, our, um, our guest of honor uh, for today are Paul Irwin and uh, Benedict Truman. Um, Dr. Irwin is Dean and Professor of the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, he is a longtime editorial board member of JPHMP and is associate editor for the American Journal of Public Health, another fine uh, public health journal. Um, Dr. Truman is the Associate Director for Science, uh, National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD and TB Prevention for the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Um, he is also an editorial board member for JPHMP and he is the consulting editor for infectious disease for the journal. Next slide, please. So why are we here? Um, so there's a, a well-traveled quote uh, from Dr. Uh, Larry Green, that if we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. And I don't think that quote ever stops being true. Um, you know, the best source of public health um, practice-based evidence is a practice community. The practice community, um, that is where the expertise is contained about how to do public health on the ground at the policy level. Um, unfortunately, uh, people's jobs and responsibilities don't always allow them the time to uh, publish and very possibly um, not a chance to build skills that are uh, necessary to successfully navigate academic publishing. So the purpose of this webinar series is to provide some guidance to practitioners who would like to publish their important work in peer reviewed journals. Um, you know, our hope is that we will help demystify this process, provide some encouragement and increase the availability of practice-based evidence in the peer reviewed literature. Um, I can say this is not intended to get, you know, people to submit just to JPHMP. Um, we would love to see you publish wherever uh, it is that you feel your work is most appropriate. And we'll talk about how to pick an appropriate outlet 
in one of our uh, later webinars. Um, but, um, you know, our goal is to really kind of pull back the curtain and hear from the experts on, you know, how they have navigated this coming from the practice world and how you can too. Next slide, please. So our learning objectives are to, for today are described the importance of publishing among uh, public health practitioners, which I hope we've started already. Um, explain the key components of a plan to publish, especially um, towards the beginning of the process and discuss challenges of publishing and how to overcome them. Um, it is not insurmountable. Um, it just takes a plan, just takes some experience. Um, and I believe with that, um, I'll bring up our, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Irwin. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Donnie, and um, good afternoon to everyone. It's um, an honor for me to be able to participate in today's webinar, and I uh, look forward to uh, having the conversation with you. Um, next slide, please. In my time with you this afternoon, um, I will highlight my background uh, with emphasis on my time in public health practice, because that's when I began to, um, to write and publish in my years in practice to provide some examples of some of those early papers um, and to uh, ask and answer the question, why publish? Why do this? Why spend this time? and then to identify um, pitfalls in writing and submitting a manuscript based on my experiences. Next slide. So to provide a bit of background uh, as, as maybe context for my comments um, during this um, webinar, um, <clears throat> After I completed um, my medical degree and residency in internal medicine and, and an MPH um, in international health, I spent two years in Karachi, Pakistan uh, as an international health fellow. Um, this was 1988 to 90, uh, quite a few years ago. Um, and when I returned in, to the United States, um, I wanted to put myself in an environment uh, where I really had an opportunity to learn about public health practice, not from an academic perspective, but from a practice perspective. So I um, took a job with the Tennessee Department of Health um, and was uh, with the Tennessee Department of Health for a number of years uh, as the uh, first the health officer and then eventually the director for a 15 county region, mostly in Appalachia, East Tennessee. I did spend uh, a year uh, during that time at the Buncombe County Health Department, which is Asheville, North Carolina. And then in 2007, uh, as, as some might say, I went over to the dark side of academia, uh, first um, moving to the University of Tennessee. I had been based in Knoxville, Tennessee for my public health practice work. And, um, and, and so I jumped across the, ri the, the river, uh, literally and figuratively, and joined the faculty at the University of Tennessee. And then in 2018, I had the opportunity to uh, join um, the School of Public Health uh, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I'm currently dean and professor. Next slide, please. So to give you an example of some of the early papers that, um, that I worked on uh, while I was in public health practice, these papers were um, very simple and straightforward in trying to address some practice-based questions and, and problems. You know, one of the first things that, um, that, that sort of came up to me uh, as the health officer for this 15 county health department region was the reluctance to, um, uh, to prescribe uh, combined hormo hormonal oral contraceptives for women um, uh, during their period of lactation. Um, and I, I 
approach this as just a, a very simple practice-based problem. Why, why was this an issue? What did the literature actually say about it? Uh, and what could I propose? So this was, this was not a, um, you know, a, a, a high level research, a, you know, a, a randomized control trial or anything like this. It was a thought piece um, and, uh, and explored that question. Why can't we prescribe combined hormonal oral contraceptives? What did the literature actually say? Um, another one of the very practical problems I faced very early on in my time in public health practice was the reporting of communicable diseases. Um, we have reporting requirements. Those of you in practice know this full well, uh, yet we also know that um, that there is a substantial degree of underreporting. Why? Why is that the case? It um, sort of befuddled me um, as a public health practitioner. So I, I, I wanted to explore this. Um, one of the um, um, one of the activities that we were heavily engaged in when I was with the Tennessee Department of Health uh, was uh, in doing community health assessments. And so I, I used that opportunity to, to write about and explore um, issues pertaining to social justice, uh, a particular interest of mine um, that, um, you know, that I inherited from a, a, a lifelong mentor of mine, um, and, and so again, sort of wrote a thought piece about using community health assessments um, to talk about social justice. Um, and then there were the very practical and um, common uh, things that any of us in public health practice would experience. And I would say, particularly if, um, if you come into public health practice um, uh, with, um, with, with training in, in one of the, the health sciences, such as being trained as a physician or, or a nurse, and that's disease outbreak investigations. And so um, I use the opportunity um, as we were investigating a number of outbreaks over a period of many years to, uh, to, uh, to write about these investigations. I benefited greatly from um, people in the central office in the Tennessee Department of Health who were skilled uh, practitioners and writers and uh, who um, spent a lot of time with me in the early years um, learning to write about uh, these disease outbreak investigations that, that we were um, in, in, that we were exploring. There were several articles that I uh, was a part of in exploring a new uh, focal area for uh, lacrosse encephalitis, a mosquito-borne um, disease. Um, and um, so these titles are examples of, of, of other um, issues as well, other problems. Again, all from a very practical uh, perspective. You know, what's the issue and, and what are you gonna do about it from a public health practice perspective? Next slide. So um, some examples of, of early papers to sort of, again, further expand upon that notion of, um, of taking a practical approach to, to issues. Um, doing a health assessment of the East Tennessee region uh, using maps. Again, this is, um, you know, this is not New England Journal um, uh, breaking news kind of material, but very practice-based, um, uh, you know, uh, practice-oriented approaches to, to doing this work. Um, a, a lot of my work uh, in the, in, in, you know, at the, um, around 2000 and, and, uh, and after that period of time, focused on MAP, Mobilizing for Action Through Planning and Partnerships. I was on the original uh, NACHO work group uh, that developed MAP. And so we started using um, MAP in its very early days in East Tennessee and simply trying to write about it, trying to write about what we were experiencing. Um, and then um, once I transitioned over into academia to continue um, talking about um, 
public health practice and to write about public health practice. So next slide, please. So why publish? Why take the time? Next. Uh, I simply enjoy writing and the opportunity to tell a good story well. I, I, I just enjoy writing. It's something that I've um, um, been, been pleased to, to do. Next. Uh, yes, there's a lot of satisfaction in being able to share something of value with colleagues, colleagues in public health practice, colleagues uh, outside of public health practice, um, colleagues in academia, in practice. Um, next, please. It builds a network. Um, you know, I'm 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 here in large part because of the early um, uh, networks that I established through submitting manuscripts to the Journal of Public Health Practice and Management. Uh, Justin has been a longtime associate editor. Lloyd Novick uh, as the editor in chief. Um, and um, building a network of colleagues across the country who were doing both practice and practice-based or practice-focused writing and publishing. Next. And it prepares you for the next job. You never know what that next job might be, uh, but certainly for my own career pathway, it, it certainly prepared me for those next jobs. Next slide. So let me talk about a few pitfalls in, in publishing. The, the first thing that I will comment on, and this will appear in, in several subsequent slides, is read. Take the time to read um, not only the journals themselves, but take time to read the author instructions. Uh, those instructions are online for almost every journal now and, and are certainly um, in, in print form as well. So read the journals, read the kinds of things that journals publish because they, they publish different things. They publish uh, things with different areas of emphasis. Um, I'm not going to be um, uh, likely uh, submitting something to the New England Journal of Medicine, although I did submit one, uh, one manuscript that got rejected. Um, mostly it's gonna be practice focused work. Um, next. Um, so for the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, look at the information for authors. Next. Um, and then explore all of that information. Um, explore um, how to submit a manuscript, the information for authors, which provides a lot of great guidance for, for authors. Next slide, please. And, and so, as you're thinking about this and as you're reading different journals and looking at different materials, um, you know, read the author instructions very carefully. There are certain pieces um, of a manuscript that you will need. Uh, there are certain um, um, parts to the overall um, publication process that you need to be acquainted with how to put together a manuscript electronically and submit it. Um, every journal has its own set of formats, its own set of, um, of stipulations regarding word length. And even within um, each journal, uh, there are different article types, some that um, have a limit of something as short as 700 words, something that have uh, limits all the way up to 5,000 words. And so being acquainted with those and being cognizant of those. Different reference styles. Um, you know, some uh, use the, uh, the reference style uh, that uh, is used in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice that uses uh, superscript numbers uh, in order of appearance um, in, in the article. Some uh, are alphabetical. Um, be familiar with the reference style of the journal that uh, you're thinking about submitting to. And be thoughtful about the cover letter. Cover letters are read. I, I continue to work as an associate editor for the American Journal of Public Health, and I pay uh, great attention to the cover letter, which may be as short as a paragraph, um, but it's, it's an important way to, uh, to indicate what, uh, what, what is there. 
uh, why are manuscripts rejected? It, they're not a good fit for the journal. Uh, different journals emphasize different things. Poor attention to detail. And then failure to answer the so what question. That is, so you have this finding, so you make this statement, so what? What does it mean? What are the implications for practice and for research? Next slide. So again, I'll go through these very quickly um, as I'm uh, approaching my time limit. Uh, for the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, there are a number of different um, article types that uh, you might consider ranging in, in, in length from 1,500 to 3,500 words. Next slide. For the American Journal of Public Health, um, things as short as 1,200 words um, up to 2,500 words for opinion editorials would be the areas that I would uh, focus on. Next slide. And for public health reports um, that publishes case studies uh, up to 2,500 words and commentaries uh, up to 2,500 words as well. Next slide. So with that, um, let me hand over um, the, um, the next uh, uh, piece of this presentation uh, to uh, Dr. Benedict Truman, who will talk about practice-based publishing. Ben? Thank you, Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, most people call me uh, Ben. I'm the Associate Director for Science at uh, one of the um, centers at the CDC. Next slide, please. And first, I have to remember to tell you that these are my own opinions, and they do not reflect the, um, the official um, statements of the CDC. I'll tell you a little bit about my public health practice experiences and explain why I think reading, writing, and science reporting is practice. I'll talk about the contents of practice-based publications and how I have earned uh, the role as a uh, principal investigator or uh, co-investigator and the various uh, author roles that I've played, how I make time for reading, analysis, and writing, and ensuring the quality and the ethics of my scientific reports, selecting uh, target journals and responding to uh, journal rejections. Next slide, please. I attended medical school and did my internal medicine residency at Howard University in Washington, DC in the mid seventies. Did a residency in preventive medicine and public health, including an MPH at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore from 1980 to 83. And I had two practical local health department experiences. One at the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, I took care of patients in the STD clinic and at the Washington County Health Department in Hagerstown, Maryland, where I investigated uh, infectious disease outbreaks and did other um, types of um, local health department uh, activities. As an EIS officer at the CDC from 1983 to 1985, I spent two years at the Monroe County Health Department in Rochester, New York, and did some of the same things that Dr. Orrin described uh, that he did in, uh, in, in Tennessee. I then moved uh, for my first real job to um, the New York State Health Department in uh, Albany, New York. And from 1985 to 1989, I served as a medical epidemiologist and uh, public health uh, physician. It was there that I met uh, Lloyd Novick. Lloyd was my supervisor, one of uh, three supervisors that I, that I had at one time at the State Health Department. I was the director of the HIV AIDS epidemiology and uh, surveillance program for New York State from 1986 to 1989, and did a lot of work with the, um, the 57 county health departments in the state of New York. I came back to CDC in 1989 and, and worked in several different jobs as a medical epidemiologist and as a public health uh, physician in 
uh, five different uh, centers and offices um, at the uh, at the CDC. Next slide, please. As the associate director for science for this for the center, I help to set um, center-wide science priorities. I oversee extramural research for the three infectious disease centers at the CDC, my center, the National Center for uh, Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, and the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. I review and approve a lot of study protocols and uh, draft um, journal uh, articles. And in doing so, I'm asking, is the content clear? Is it accurate? Is it precise? Is it ethical? And is it useful for um, practitioners? And then is it consistent with existing policies and practices of the CDC or the jurisdiction in which um, the study was, um, was done? I feel an obligation if my findings are um, not aligned with existing policies to try to change those policies or practices to bring them into line with um, the, the scientific findings. I spend about 30% of my time analyzing data and writing uh, manuscripts for, um, for uh, publication. As Justin mentioned, I'm the consulting editor for infectious diseases for the journal. And there I review manuscripts, I recruit peer reviewers and recommend a final editor's decision either to accept, to revise, or to uh, reject the manuscript. And in making my judgments, I'm asking, is the content new? Is it true? And is it useful for uh, practitioners? Next slide, please. What makes a publication practice-based? I think a publication is practice-based if it includes public health practice recommendations. If it's reporting on an outbreak or an epidemic investigation and response. For example, the, the COVID um, outbreak is under uh, continuing investigation and uh, response. If it provides evidence of population need for any of the 10 essential public health services. If it reports on surveillance, program evaluation, and applied or implementation research. Some people do not think of um, research as, as practice, but we focus, we tend to focus on applied or implementation research in state and local health departments. If the document contains evidence of intervention program effectiveness or cost effectiveness, it's practical. And finally, if the authors are affiliated with a public health agency, that is the work was done within that setting and the expectation is that it will be most useful to people that work in those settings. The next slide. In my experience, I've, I've earned the, uh, the role of principal um, investigator by conceiving a testable hypothesis or a study question that I can uh, justify as being uh, important. Secondly, actually writing the study protocol or the analysis plan. I find if you do that, you have a strong claim to being the principal investigator or the lead uh, author for the resulting uh, publication. If you secure funds or approval or all these other study resources, you can often claim um, the, uh, the role as a co-investigator. If you get uh, IRB approval of the study ethics, that's the most institutions have an institutional review um, board that makes sure that the plan for the study um, will not cause um, unintended harm to our participants. Getting the OMB approval, if it's a federal information collection. As you might know, the OMB is the Office of Management and Budget and they have the final approval of what's called a control number that goes on your, um, your questionnaire or your instrument if you're collecting information for the uh, federal government. 
You can't proceed unless you get that control number. And lastly, by acquiring or collecting data to answer the study question, you have a claim as to the role of um, co-investigator or a co-author of the resulting paper. Next slide. The kinds of contributions that you can make, again, in conceiving and designing the study is often rewarded. Um, writing the study protocol or the analysis plan, actually analyzing data to answer the study question. Repeating the analysis to avoid and correct errors. This is a big issue uh, with me, and this is important and often overlooked. And then the authors of a published paper have to either retract or correct something that should have been corrected during the, the writing of the paper. You can prepare tables and charts that answer the study questions. You can write, revise, and approve the different sections of the draft manuscript the introduction that justifies the study, the methods, what you did, the results, what you found, and a discussion of what the findings mean. And important for uh, practitioners, you can write about the practical implications of the findings. What can you do with the results that would make a difference in the, the health status of some population? As Paul said, the so what uh, questions. Quite often, practitioners can be influential in deciding what the paper says about the practical implications of the findings. And, and as you know, you have to compete for uh, first, second, senior, or the corresponding author roles. And you do that by justifying those roles based on your contribution to the paper. Next slide. I try to schedule reading, analysis, and writing, um, particularly reading journal articles before and after work. I try to analyze data before and after work as well. I only write when my mind is fresh, not when I'm tired. I try to avoid unscheduled interruptions while doing those tasks. I collaborate with a writer editor, so I don't have to worry about grammar and syntax and, um, and with other contributors to the paper. I try to make and keep deadlines for delivering drafts. Uh, that's one way um, you can lose your, um, your role on a publication if you're unable to, um, to deliver the drafts when they're due. Then it usually goes to somebody else. One thing that's important for me is that these tasks are included in my performance evaluation plan. So I don't have to argue with my supervisor about why I'm doing this. It's right there and I'm evaluated on the basis of this work each year. That's important in getting your supervisor's support for your work. You can't do this kind of work unless your supervisor supports it. And I found over the years that if you can um, if you can offer your supervisor co-authorship on a manuscript, manuscript for which you are the lead author, that often goes a, a long way in getting your supervisor's support. Next slide. What are the indicators of a high quality scientific uh, content? Well, you have to have a clear study question or a testable hypothesis. The methods of data collection, analysis, and interpretation have to be clear, complete, so that they can be replicated by others if they choose to do that. Your findings have to be accurate and valid, precise, meaning that you know how much uncertainty surrounds the estimates that you're describing, and it ought to be that generalizable to a known population. You ought to be able to say to which population um, does the main finding apply? And the findings have to have important, important implications for public health practice, for public health programs, and for policy interventions. The findings have to be clear, written in plain English. They have to be timely and useful to practitioners. I use the standards of the Equator 
network to remind me what ought to be in a well-written, complete scientific report. And I provided you with the link to that website. Next slide, please. Most, most um, journals would require that you provide a statement that reassures the editor that your study procedures were approved ethically by some independent body. Usually it's an IRB. If what you're doing involves human research procedures and it ought to be done before the study is uh, started. And they worry about things like informed consent, privacy and confidentiality procedures, and whether you're doing all that you can to protect participants from unintended research related harms. If you're working with animals, laboratory animals, um, some practical studies can only be done in laboratory animals. Um, and uh, there is a, a, an, a committee that does similar work to an IRB to make sure that the study procedures are humane. Um, and if the animals have to be euthanized, euthanized at the end of the study that it's done uh, uh, humanely. And if you're not, if uh, such a committee is not involved in reviewing your study because of the nature of the study, it's, it's often important to get some agency official not involved in the study to review the ethics of your study. And so you can provide that statement that the journal will require saying that this was done. Next slide, please. Selecting target journals. I often get recommendations and justifications from potential co-authors. I try to ver verify that the content fits the journal's purpose its scope and the audience by trying to find a similar article that's already been published. I try to consider the suitability of the journal's publication profile, its impact factor, how often articles in that journal get cited, the circulation, how many, how many people actually read the journal, the frequency of publication, is it every one, two, three or six months? Is it published online first? Is it open access? Do you have to pay author fees or other charges, such as per page charges or charges for color figures? And will the published article be indexed in PubMed or Scopus so readers can find it easily? Sometimes I check with the journal editor regarding the interest in the type of study that I'm doing. And I try to avoid predatory journals. And you know, those are, those are um, plentiful. There are lots of journals but they're there to take your money and, um, and, and not really do the work of making sure that your research is um, good enough to be published. The next slide. Responding to journal rejections. I've gotten quite a few rejections from, um, from Dr. Dr. Moore and Dr. Um, Novik, even though I'm the um, consulting editor for infectious diseases for the journal. And I've been in that role for about six years. I have had um, my uh, manuscripts rejected. Um, and what I've done is to remember that the same content can have different levels of interest for practitioners who read different journals. So I try to find another journal and another practitioner audience pool to, um, to uh, Dis disseminate the findings to. I usually consider the revisions that are suggested by the peer reviewers. I try to review, to revise, to improve the study that was done and not the study that was proposed by the peer reviewers. I try to revise to um, improve the substantive content rather than the rejecting journal's preferred writing style. I try to revise and, and resubmit to a credible journal uh, to which target practitioners can be directed after publication. And again, I try to avoid the uh, predatory journals at all costs. The next slide. These are some examples of the, uh, what I believe to be practice-based publications that I've been, been involved in. 
The, the first one is a systematic review of the literature for the Community Preventive Services Task Force in order to um, justify their recommendations of permanent supportive housing with Housing First to reduce homelessness and to promote health among homeless populations with disability. That was, that was published in JPHMP in, 20, in September of 2020. The second one, I was the first author of a paper that looked at differential association of HIV funding with HIV mortality by race and ethnicity in the United States from 1999 to 2017. The question was whether these different racial and ethnic groups um, benefited in the same way in terms of the reduction of um, mortality from HIV from the funding that was provided by the federal government during those years. And we found that um, unexpectedly that um, Hispanic groups and non-Hispanic black groups experience faster rates of decline in mortality um, during that time, time period. The next slide, the next, um, I'm sorry, the next um, publication was about uh, COVID-19 hospitalization by race and ethnicity and its association with chronic conditions among Medicare beneficiaries from January 1st to September 30th, 2020. This, this paper was rejected by um, Health Affairs in November and we just got it um, accepted at another journal for, um, and it's now in press. I think it's been, it's been published all, already. Next slide. The first one is about factors associated with latent tuberculosis infection treatment failure among patients with commercial health insurance in the United States from 2005 to 2016. And there, the question was whether there were some modifiable risk factors that were associated with treatment failure that we can, uh, we can correct. Those who practice um, TB prevention know that treatment failure, um, when you're trying to treat uh, latent TB infection to avoid reactivation TB can be a big problem in some jurisdictions. The next one was on the completeness of reporting of race and ethnicity data in the national, nationally notifiable diseases surveillance system of the United States from 2006 to 2010. We published that article um, describing some of the factors that are responsible for incomplete reporting by race and ethnicity, a problem that we're struggling with today with regard to uh, COVID-19. And the last one is on racial and ethnic disparities in hospitalizations and deaths associated, associated with the 2009 pandemic influenza A virus infections in the United States. That was published in 2011. And we are finding with COVID-19, some of the same predisposing factors. And, uh, and so some of the same um, remedies that um, work then might be useful in, in, in terms of COVID-19. Uh, uh, Next slide. Thank you, um, JP. I would like to hand over um, to you. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks to both of our presenters for the great insight into your careers in publishing as practitioners. Um, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to drive home before we go into the Q&A is that practice-based publishing takes all sorts of forms. Uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, research, evaluation, and, and a little bit about implementation science as well. So there are lots of different ways that you can come into this. You, you also heard early on from Paul talking more about the kind of commentary or analytic essay approach, where you're addressing um, theoretical issues as much as, as anything else. But one of the things I do want to drive home is that you, uh, you need to plan for publishing. Uh, taking time out of, out of your day um, can be challenging. And so coming up with a, a workflow that doesn't make this purely additive, but works into your your other tasks um, can, can be very practical. 
Uh, the final thing I would say before we move into Q&A is that you have to ready yourself for rejection and not take it personally, even if some of the comments might be intended that way or feel like they're intended that way. Um, I think all of us on, on this line that you'll hear from have all had rejections, some of which have been harsh, I'm sure. And how you, how you handle that is really try and view the rejection, no matter the tenor, as a means of improving before you submit to another journal. So, so don't try and take it personally, try not to internalize that, but, but really try and introspect based on it. Um, I, think, I think now, Donnie, let's move into the q and I've got a couple questions up. If our, um, our presenters could turn on their microphones and video. I'll start with the first question and I will invite members of the audience to put questions into the chat. I'll try and triage them as we go through. Um, Justin, I'd like to start with a question for you. Uh, folks who are, are new to this space um, may have questions about how journals view IRB judgments and how that interacts with publishing. Often work is exempt. Um, it would be helpful to know the journal's view on um, exempt status versus non-exempt status and when you need IRB judgments before submission. And and Paul, I, I'd invite you to follow up. On, on yeah, no, it's an excellent question. And we, um, prior to some recent IR, um, IRB or human subjects research guidance changes that have been ongoing, we published an, an editorial that's still mostly accurate in the journal about this. And, and basically the summary is, you know, if you're dealing with you know, the classic definition of human subjects data, you do need an IRB uh, decision. Now, if that's exempt, um, that, that's fine. It just, it means that you're, um, you know, it's, it's no longer needs to be considered by the IRB. Um, if it's a slam dunk case of clearly not human subjects uh, research. So for example, if you're doing a review of policy documents, um, and you may not have uh, obviously an access to an IRB like I would at a university or you would at a university. Um, JPHMP will consider those, but you should make an explicit case for that in your cover letter um, and uh, note that in the uh, manuscript itself. So uh, we take a slightly um, looser view of things simply because there are certain things that are just clearly not um, uh, human subjects research. Now, um, simple because data are de-identified, um, it would not necessarily meet that criteria. And, you know, that's why we always encourage, you know, the academic health department um, approach where you do have an academic team member who can get a, you know, exempt designation from the IRB. But we will take at the journal, we do take things on a case-by-case -case basis where some other journals are very explicit that you have to have an IRB letter. Um, so, you know, when in doubt, check with us directly. Paul, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Just to, just to reemphasize Justin's last point, you know, when, when in doubt, ask the question, send an email to Justin or send an email to the editors of the journal that you're interested in, in publishing. Um, you know, most will respond very efficiently, very effectively. Um, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't get caught spinning your wheels. All right, the next question I'd like to ask. Um, JP, JP, may I just add um, very briefly, um, my job at the CDC is the final sign off on, um, on the, the review of um, protocols um, before they're sent to the IRB. And I think um, there, is, there is some um, unfamiliar, unfamiliarity in some journals with how that works. They seem, some journal the editors assume that every protocol is sent to an IRB. That is not the case. It's only the ones that involve um, human subjects, uh, human research subjects that go to an IRB. So when I've asked the IRB, for a letter to send to the journal, they have said, I can't give you a letter because your, your work is not human research and we don't review the ethics of studies that are not human research. What JP referred to as the exempt 
um, uh, studies. It's not that they're exempt from ethical review. The review is done by someone other than an IRB. Thank you, Ben. Uh, ben, this next question is for you and also for Paul. Um, there, there were a number of questions in chat as you both were presenting about uh, trying to figure out what's publishable. Are my data too old? Uh, will this kind of evaluation work be publishable versus something that's more clinically oriented research? Could you each in turn talk a little bit about how you make those decisions? Is the data too old? Can this evaluation work be um, published? Is it rigor rigorous enough? And, and just talk through that decision making. Ben? For, for me, the key determinant is whether it has um, a message for practitioners. Does it present findings um, that can be used by practitioners to improve public health? Every, every other criterion in my view is um, subordinate to that. Um, I know that um, as a, as a um, consulting editor, um, I'm not gonna persuade Justin or Lloyd to accept a paper that's not new, that's old. But sometimes you have to be flexible in deciding what's new and how new is new enough. If there is no other information on the topic and the data are five years old, I believe those ought to be published because the, uh, the truth that's being described in the paper is still useful. It hasn't been refuted. And, and to, to Ben's comments, I would just add that as a rough rule of thumb, and it's very rough, I think that five-year time frame is an appropriate time frame. Um, anything outside that, that five years is going to be problematic in terms of submitting it for a new publication. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a question that I'll direct to, to Justin, but open to uh, everyone on, on the line here. There are many practitioners that do not have affiliations that give them access to peer-reviewed literature. Can you talk about how that impacts ability to publish and any recommendations you would have for addressing that issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a conundrum. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why I have been on the, the front end uh, of, of probably the wave of people who've been okay with open access journals as long as they're reputable, because I think it democratizes the information produced. Um, and and you know, I, I'm hardly a pioneer there. There are a lot of organizations that are now requiring um, open access as part of their, um, uh, as part of their funding guidelines. Um, but it can be really tough, right? Um, because technically, and this is very technically, but if I publish an article in a non-open access journal, and you, JP, ask me to email you a copy, I am technically violating copyright. Um, it's pretty strict. So publishing, posting something to ResearchGate or any online repository without owning copyright is technically a violation of copyright. Now, obviously people are not gonna, usually gonna come after you. Um, they're gonna go after ResearchGate, but it is one of the biggest problems. Um, to plug the journal, I will say, is one of the reasons why we created, with funding uh, from the De Beaumont Foundation, um, a companion site for JPHMP called JPHMP Direct, where we um, don't publish the articles per se, but we do publish, you know, interviews, infographics, blog posts, um, and other, um, you know, podcasts, other ways to get the information out there. So even if you can't get behind the paywall, you can still glean some of the information there. Um, but, uh, and someone in the chat has actually made an excellent point that sometimes uh, health departments have relationships with other entities to allow um, you know, access. But yeah, it is still one of the biggest problems and biggest frustrations. And just as an academic, one of the reasons why I, I try to publish open access if I have you know, a few dollars to rub together simply because I want you know, my work to be available to people on the front lines. So just in the interest of time, I would like to ask one last question before we turn it back over to, to Donnie for housekeeping. Um, 
There are many different types of, of journal articles that, that one might be able to write. Paul, you went over some of them. Ben, you alluded to them. Um, certainly, Justin, you've, you've talked about them over, uh, over the last couple of years. Can you, help, um, can you help the audience distinguish, is this uh, the thing that I'm thinking of, is this more appropriate for uh, a, you know, a clinical or otherwise um, population-based research-oriented journal versus I'm thinking about doing more of an evaluation of my programmatic work or practice-based work. And just how, how can they navigate that when there's, there's quite a wide landscape? Um, Paul, how about I turn to you and then Ben and then Justin? Sure, thank you, JP. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would say again that the best way to answer that question for yourself is to read the journals and to look at the, um, the different kinds of articles that, that different journals publish. And, you know, the top three in my book for what we're talking about on this seminar would be the Journal of Public Health Management Practice, the American Journal of Public Health, and Public Health Reports. If you just spend time reading those, and many of those articles um, are available uh, to anyone um, through PubMed, uh, not, not just to the research community. Um, read what is being published um, and get a sense for the range of the kinds of things that are being published. Um, that's, that's my biggest encouragement. Thank you. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And uh, you have to believe that you have something worth talking about and that people will want to read because they, they'll think that it's useful in what they do. Dustin? Yeah, I, w I would ask it, I would answer really from a standpoint of, you know, are there other people struggling with the kind of issues that you've struggled with and, and are, are, would benefit from this? I, I always say, I love to publish that, that article that I wish existed when I started the project. And if that's something that when you're, you're thinking about writing it up, um, you know, you're like, man, I wish I had this article so I wouldn't have made the mistakes and, and had the struggles that I had, then it's probably worth it. Um, and so be it evaluation, be it policy implementation, be it training, education, what have you, um, I think that's a good litmus test. And when in doubt, shoot me an email. Um, we're happy to save you some time um, before you, you know, start getting the submission you know, pieces together. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Donnie. I do want to leave with one just um, thought for your consideration. Uh, we've talked about rejection several times, in part because it's the reality of publishing. In some ways, it's, it's a numbers-based thing as much as anything else. And I just want to bring up that right now with COVID, there are a lot of folks publishing. Justin, I don't know if you want to disclose or poll you what rejection rates and submission rates are looking like these days, but many, many journals are in the 80 to 95% rejection range right now mm -hmm. as a function of submissions. Right. Yeah, I can say that we've seen um, in excess of a 40% increase in submissions um, over the last year. And um, our rejection rate is approximately 85%. I will say though, because we do have a preference for practical work um, it, is, it is probably higher for academics trying to publish more esoteric type work than it is for more practice applied work. If there's a nugget of, of wisdom there and maybe um, it needs to be polished a little bit, we're willing to work with you um, at, on the practice end probably a little bit more. So that number would be lower, but it's, it's still a very high bar. All right, with that, Donnie, take it away. All righty, we've got about a minute left. So just wanted to put a plug for the other webinars in our series. Um, there's a link here. Uh, I've also put it in the chat. Um, I understand people are having a couple issues with that. So I'll try to put, the, put an updated version. It should be the right thing though. Um, so we have a couple more webinars in our series. And we also have an evaluation that we would really appreciate for you all to complete, to give us some feedback to inform our future sessions. And um, with that, 
If you have any more information don't has, uh, or any questions and you'd like more information, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be sure to put you in touch with the right people. Um, we'd like to thank all of our presenters today and hope that everyone has a great rest of the day.